Pushkin. I could turn on the news right now and find someone making a prediction about the future. They might be saying there's no way Congress is going to pass some particular bill by the end of the year, or maybe they'd be dead certain that the U.S. economy is about to start shrinking. And, you know, I could try to parse the logic and assess the evidence behind the arguments. I could try to figure out whether these forecasters have some ulterior motive. But, I mean, come on. I don't have time to do a research project on every claim some pseudo-expert makes in the news. What I want is some source that will aggregate all these different predictions about the future. I'd like it if this source could give more weight to people who have higher conviction about their views. And ideally, this source would force the people making predictions to put something on the line, to put some skin in the game. I want the people predicting the future to gain if they're right and lose if they're wrong. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and this is What's Your Problem, the show where entrepreneurs and engineers talk about how they're going to change the world once they solve a few problems. My guest today is Luana Lopez Lara, co founder of Kalshi.com. K A L S H I.com. You got to spell it every time. I do. I do. It's a hard name. <laughs> Kalshi is an exchange, kind of like a stock exchange. But when people use Kalshi, they don't make bets on stocks. They make bets on what's going to happen in the world. Everything from what bills Congress is going to pass to what's going to happen with inflation. Kalshi's problem, Luana's problem, is this. How do you become the New York Stock Exchange of real-world events? It turns out that in the United States, if you want to let people bet on real-world events that are not sports, you have to get the approval of U.S. financial regulators. Last year, Kalshi became the first major prediction market to get that approval. Their site went live and started taking bets from ordinary people last summer. Luana and her co-founder went to MIT, and in the summers, they did internships on Wall Street trading desks. That was where they got the idea for Kalshi. But it wasn't what the traders did for work that inspired them. It was what they did for fun, constantly placing these tradable bets with each other on everything that was happening in the news. They called it the market maker game. So we used to do that like all day uh, in the jobs when you're like, just turn around and you make a market on this news going up on the on the TV. Um, and and it was pretty much the whole day. Because it's a lot of like just trading stocks is kind of behaves the same way, right? Yeah. If it gets low and you want to buy low, sell high, you think there's a fair value. Um, and we did that all the time. So how did that lead you to start the company? Right. So this is one part of it. I think the other part that was pointing us more into this prediction market route um, was really that through our trading experience and through our finance experience, we really realized that most trading is just based on events. I think the best uh, one example of this is, for example, Brexit, right? Like when my co-founder was at Goldman, a lot of different firms were calling up the, like his exotic trading desk at Goldman and being like, I want to get exposure to Brexit. Uh -huh. So they would come up with this very complicated uh, type of bundles of like volatility swaps, FX and things like that. So it's, so it's basically investors are like, well, I think Brexit will affect the market in a bunch of different ways. And I mm -hmm. want to either make a bet or hedge some risk that I have. Mm -hmm. But there was no way you could just say, give me money if Brexit happens or I will give you money Absolutely. if Brexit happens. You couldn't just bet on the event. No. Um, and yeah. And for us, when we saw this like repeated in, in many different uh, experiences and, and coupled with like how much we saw people just like to trade on things. It was just nagging on our head. Why is there no direct way that people can just trade on what they think is going to happen, trade directly on events and get direct exposure? So we decided to that if someone was going to do it, it should be us. And we embarked on this crazy journey for the past three years and a half. But that was kind of the start. If the question is, why doesn't a market like this exist? Why isn't there a place where people can just bet on events happening or not happening? What was the answer? Why didn't it exist? The answer is plain and clear is, was regulation. Basically, the background is uh, events are deemed as commodities and commodity derivatives trading are regulated by the CFTC, which is a Commodity Futures Trading Commission. It's a, a U.S. regulatory agency that yeah. oversees things like, what, o oil futures and wheat futures and exactly. lots of things like that. Right. It's now, a like giant, Bitcoin, giant yeah. markets, right? Yeah. yeah. So huge, big regulator, big market, and it clearly falls under their jurisdiction. So you decide you want to do this. Mm -hmm. You realize that you have to get the approval of this big U.S. regulator, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Yep. 
And then you just go to them and say, can we do it? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I said my background before, but I'm a computer scientist. I have nothing to do with, with, I don't know anything about the law. But we knew regulation was a big thing. And we also knew we didn't know anything about it. So the first day what we did is we just created a spreadsheet of like 60 names of possible lawyers that we could call. You knew you needed a lawyer. I, we knew we needed a lawyer. lawyer. Okay. Yes, that's true. So we went like one by one and really like everyone was saying, no, it's not even worth your time. Like you need an insane amount of money and they're going to say no. Like they're going to say no, they're going to say no, they're going to say no, they're going to say no. So you're calling all these lawyers on the list and people are like, don't bother, bad idea, not <laughs> right. going to work. And then what happens? Right. And then um, I had a friend who went actually to Harvard Law School and then she had another friend who had a friend who had a friend. <laughs> and then like for a fourth degree connection, we got connected to this law firm in New York and then that law firm knew this lawyer that works with us here today. His name is Jeff Benman. He was an ex ex CFTC official. Okay. And he said, maybe let's think about it. Okay. And we we're like, look, we're gonna take the anything we can get, and a maybe is better than no. And then it's just a huge and long engagement of like you present to them, you send certain materials, they give a lot of feedback on what they think is bad, which is always massive list. <laughs> um, and then you go back to them and they are like, okay, these ones maybe. And then like this ones, we're still concerned about this. And now we have all these other concerns. How long did you think it was going to take when you started? Um, we initially were very optimistic and thought it was going to take around six months. Um, and then when it was four months, we were like, we were crazy to think it's six months. It's probably like a year. And then when it's nine months, we're like, okay, at minimum a year and a half. And they kept going. And I remember but when it passed to the two-year mark, we were like, what are we doing? Like, we just, you know, graduated from MIT. We should, like, be making some money, have a job. And we're just here, like, you know, fighting through this thing. And, like, nothing launched, no contract traded, nothing. If I told you from the beginning we knew what was going to happen and we knew it was going to work and it would take this amount of time, that would be a lie. We, we, knew, we didn't know anything, honestly. So is part of the case you have to make to the CFTC why your exchange is useful and not just a casino? Yeah. So what is that case, simply? What's the simple version of why why Calshi is useful? Well, there are, people have a lot of risks that they don't have access to hedging uh, for nowadays. Like normal people cannot hedge mortgage rates going up or things like gas prices or things like taxes going up. And these are real risks that normal everyday American face. And it's the job of the CFTC to regulate the way for them to also get access to these hedging things that the big guys can do. I will say it's not clear to me that regular people would, on average, be able to hedge in a useful way using prediction markets. I feel like, to me, what seems like a more interesting possible case for the utility of Kelshi is uh, sort of a wisdom of crowds idea, right? Like the idea that people go on the news or whatever and say things about the future. But like they might be lying, they might be wrong, they might be saying something because they have an investment they're not telling you about. But when people are betting their own money on something that's going to happen in the future, I am more inclined to believe them, right? So if there's a big well-functioning market where lots of people are betting lots of money on something that's going to happen in the future, that seems like useful information. Absolutely. We call this like the tax on bullshit, right? It's yes. it's so cheap to to just go on Twitter and Look at inflation, right? Last year, everyone is like, oh, inflation, it's nothing. Oh, we're going to see hyperinflation. And if you just have a market where people can put money where their mouth is and actually be like, I actually bought this position. This is what I believe in. You really take out a lot of like the bullshit, a lot of the, you know, just exaggeration for like hype and things like that. So let's actually look at it. Mm -hmm. I signed up for Kelsey a couple days ago and I put a hundred bucks in my account and I want to I want to make a bet. I'm not supposed to call it a bet, right? What am I supposed to call it? A prediction? A I want to take a position? Yeah, a I want trade, to... the prediction, anything you want to call it. A Can I, it feels like a bet to me. I'm going to call <laughs> it a bet. Um, so, okay. So I'm looking now. So it looks like there's a lot There's a lot of econ stuff, like you'd expect. Right. What's going to happen with Fed interest rates? What's going to happen with inflation? Weather? The weather in New York? The weather in Chicago? It's like the weather tomorrow, right? Yeah, no, there, there are some some of our users like get crazy satellite data to to trade on these markets. It's actually oh, super interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and how big are they? I'm seeing numbers here, but it's hard to know exactly what they mean. Like, how much money are people betting here? Um, I think we're doing around like more than two million dollars a week. I think two point five million dollars okay. a week. By the way, what's is there a limit on how much people can uh, bet or invest or stake? Um, yeah, right now we have a twenty-five thousand dollar limit on how much you can lose 
Okay. So not in how much you can win. So you can win up to, I guess, 2.5 million if you get the 1% long shot, but you can lose up only up until 25K at the moment. Okay. Why, why that limit? Did that come from the CFTC? No, that's actually came from us. Um, we wanted to, you know, start slow and make sure we are not breaking things. I think we worked very hard on the regulatory piece, so we want to make sure we keep everything going the right way. <laughs> Move slow and don't break things. You're the <laughs> right. anti-Facebook. Exactly. We are we are the anti-Facebook for sure. Uh, so we started this way. I think that um, we are going to have to to raise the limits going forward, especially as we, we grow to bigger players and bigger institutions. So here, so let's pick one. Um, so here's one. Permanent daylight saving time bill becomes law. Yep. Uh, it's a fun one. Like, Should I kind of care about it. It's a little bit silly. Like, I want to I want to bet on that one. I want to take a position on that one. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to click on it. And it says, and it's by the end of the year, basically. Mm-hmm. It says, uh, buy yes, 16 cents. Buy no, 87 cents. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? That means right now you can buy a yes position for, you said 16 cents? Yeah. 16 cents. So you would lock in 60 cents to be able to get 84 so if you're if you buy a yes, you're you're locking in sixteen to get eighty four. If you're right, okay, great. So so it's like uh, what is that five to one or so? I think so around yeah. that. Yeah, uh, math on a math on a podcast yeah, no, is dangerous. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and so just I mean the context on this one: the Senate mm-hmm. passed a bill earlier this year that would make daylight saving time permanent, and mm-hmm. now it's kind of stalled out. And so the market is clearly saying this is probably not going to happen. Yep. Uh, but it's not a, like a, it's not a hundred to one shot that it won't happen. Right. It could happen. Right. And I mean, I want kind of a long shot, right? I don't want to win ten bucks. Who cares, right? And the fact that it says buy yes for sixteen, does that mean someone is offering to sell it for that price? Some other market participant? Yeah, someone's willing to buy the no for eighty four. Okay. So that's why you can buy the yes for sixteen. And is Calshi in the middle on this, or are you just taking a fee? No, we are an exchange. So we just match people on, on both sides. So we just match the yes and the no, uh, and we take a small fee. So, okay, so I'm going to bet 100 bucks right now. I'm just going to do mm-hmm. it. I'm going to wild <laughs> out. This is big for me. I'm not much of a much of a gambler. Trading for contract amount. Okay, so I just type 100 bucks. 100. Okay, so for my 100 bucks, if I'm right, I'm going to win $455. So, uh, so it says fees $5.51. It's about 5% is what you're taking on this trade, Yes. Yeah, that's why we take Eskashi, yeah. Okay. And what are your fees just on average? On average, we're actually at 0.8%. Wow, so I got hosed. Yeah. <laughs> because you were taking a position, you actually paid the fee. So the oh, uh, so when interest- I sell, when I get out, I don't have to pay? You won't pay anything. Okay, well, that's, right. that's so a little, it, it takes the sting off a little. Right. If, you, if you're putting limit orders, if you're setting a price or saying, I want to buy or I want to sell at this price, you pay no fee. So. Oh, interesting. Okay, because I'm bringing liquidity to the market? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay, I'm submitting the order. Okay, so now I own it. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing that's interesting to me is I don't have to wait and see if this thing happens, right? I Not can sell to somebody else mm-hmm. who wants to take a position. Absolutely. So if you go to, uh, if you click sell on the screen and you go to a limit order. Okay. So I'm going to sell for 40 cents and I'll get paid back $222 if it happens. Yeah. So like maybe, I feel like for that, if some powerful person in Congress just says, yeah, maybe we're going to do this, right? right? If it's in the news, if there's one little blip, maybe the market will move my way. And then it just sell automatically. You just made $200, yeah. And that can, yeah, made, made 100 bucks. Anyway, 100 right? bucks, 120, yeah. Uh, and that can happen any time between now and the end of the year. Yep. So, like, I got some action now, Yeah. right? <laughs> and I do feel like, I mean, you know, people have different feelings about gambling, but like, I'm definitely gambling here and it's okay, right? Like, I'm a grown up. I have a hundred bucks. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, the, any futures market has speculators and has hedgers, right? Like, obviously, even if you look at the grain market, like the big firms on Wall Street that have the entire desk dedicated to to trading grain, they are not hedging. Like, they're not worried about their farm yeah. production. They are also speculating, but they're speculating with a lot of data and research. It's and, just degrees and, but, of speculation. And, and like price discovery is a useful function of markets, right? Absolutely. It tells the world what people betting a lot of money think is going to happen about important things. Absolutely. With inflation, our markets predict that inflation will get this high and actually beat the Bloomberg forecast, six out of the seven fast readings, just because, again, if you put money where your mouth is and if you have an actual market dictating the probability of things versus just, you know, people going out and saying, oh, I believe this is going to happen, 
you get like way better data. And, and this data, is so I think it's so important for especially the world we're in now. Okay, well, let's talk about inflation. That's <laughs> maybe the big one right now, right, in terms of the economy. What are traders on Calshi predicting about inflation for the next, oh, what, for the rest of the year, say? Yeah, so this month now, June, uh, it's predicted to be around 1% to 1.1%, uh, the month-over-month month CPI. Okay. And for the whole okay. year, it's up between 8 and 9%. Uh, I think the markets do think it was is going to start going down, but uh, I guess not at the rate that everyone wants to see. How how big is the Calshi market for inflation? How much money are people betting in that market? It goes around like two hundred, three hundred k per per month. Okay, so small. That's very small. It's still small, yeah. You know, as I'm looking over the the things you can bet on here, I mean, I I want there's a couple questions come to mind, right? Like one, what are things you're not allowed to make markets in, or that you don't make markets in? There are certain notorious cases, right? Like war or terrorism or assassination. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, I assume you wouldn't do that. No, not, not at all. Um, and these actually are explicitly, you're, you're completely right, like war, assassination, terrorism. These are actually explicitly cut off. And are there people who are prohibited from trading? Like, can insiders trade? No. Uh, yes, there are people who are prohibited from trading. Insiders cannot trade. Let me ask you this. Members of Congress sort of notoriously are allowed to trade on the stock market, even if they have inside information about what Congress is going to do. Uh, there are on your uh, market, there are things, is Congress going to pass this law or that, including the daylight savings law? Can members of Congress trade on Kelshi? No, they cannot. Huh. They can trade so, on markets that are not on the politics market. So if they want to trade on... Um, I don't uh -huh. know. The weather in New York, they can do that, but no no congressperson or uh, or their staffers can trade on it. Funnily enough, we have this market on whether the stock trading ban for Congress is going to happen this year because oh. it was very big news and we, we, we opened the market. So just to be clear, members of Congress can still trade stocks, but they cannot trade the Kalshi contract on whether they are going to ban themselves from trading stocks. Pretty sure that's a metaphor for something, but I don't know what it is. In a minute, the problem Kalshi has to solve to go from being a little site that almost nobody has ever heard of to being the New York Stock Exchange of event trading. That's the end of the ads. Now we're going back to the show. So what do you want to do that you're not doing now? I think for us, the, the biggest thing is growing growing what we have. Uh, our, our vision is to be like the New York Stock Exchange for events, and we really think that events have the capacity to grow and be like a mainstream and, you know, boring, commonplace asset class. Um, and our, our dream is to get there and really like be the exchange and help build the environment around it. So for us, it's always about innovating and releasing new contracts that are very relevant and then hopefully growing the pie. But we want to integrate with... For example, biggest other parts of Wall Street are getting brokers to offer our markets, getting market makers to come and provide liquidity. So our grow, goal is to really like build this exchange up uh, with more contracts and more more liquidity, more people. And I mean, your customers now are retail, right? They're just people like me, just like ordinary people, which I would not have guessed, right? There's another universe where what you start with is institutions, right? Big companies working through investment banks. Betting not a hundred bucks, but you know, a hundred thousand bucks or a million dollars, right? Like that in a way seems like a more, I don't know, logical place to start. Yeah. Our goal is to have these guys and institutions also come to Kaoshi. I think our strategy was pretty much like on the liquidity building. We thought it was easier to start with retail and then uh build some a base of retail like users, then bring in specific market makers to provide liquidity. And then with the market makers, we bring brokers that will increase the number of users and then more liquidity. The issue with starting an exchange with very big players is that the level of liquidity you need is, is very is uh, absurd. Uh -huh. For somebody to take a big position, you need a ton of money on the other on the side. Other side. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And with a very new asset class like ours, it's very hard to find the person to be on the other side. We thought it would be a better strategy to kind of like do building up versus like trying to to start from from that side because then we would need like hundreds of millions of dollars yeah, on the yeah. other side it would be very complicated to to start from there for us now it's really about building liquidity right it's it's about having what we have that's working and and making this a massive scale like you know when you think about stocks you're like you can buy almost any amount at any 
like price. Yeah, um, tiny and, spreads, right? It's really exactly. easy and efficient to trade stocks. Right, and it's it for us. The strategy is not to just like try. We obviously want to get a lot more traders in the platform, but it's also about having key partnerships with some Wall Street firms, having partnerships with specific brokers that have traders that do this themselves, uh, and um, and bring them in and start having this kind of like what we call like step functions in terms of liquidity. I think for us, uh-huh. our next challenge is like, okay, you guys were able to get this through the regulation. You, you're able to start playing the game. But for us to start winning the game, we need to start building liquidity and getting uh-huh. more traders. And it's it's really about that for us. It's what we're focused on. And so is that move like getting Kelshi onto the Robinhood app or like the Schwab app? Is it on the retail side or like is it getting traders at some firm to trade on Kelshi? Like what is the next step? Um two sides there i think on the market making side we want to integrate and have like the big wall street companies you can think about uh that that generally provide uh like citadel liquidity. maybe like citadel jump trading uh-huh. optiver all of these Basically guys like big high frequency traders who essentially make the market on the stock market right and yeah. for them it's what's interesting at Kosh is that obviously it's very uncorrelated to everything else they do but also because the spreads are higher they make a, more uh-huh. money for them than what they think about is it. the problem that it's too small for them well, that's what we're working for you. I think that um, so m- most of the months for Kaushi, we were very much focused on learning and getting the product to a right point. Now we're really starting to focus on on growing the the use case and the user base. Sorry, and this fits with the other part, which is actually integrating with brokers. So like getting the exchange connected to interactive brokers, Schwab, Ninja Trader, E Trade, Webull, all of these guys. It's kind of a game of like we need to time this very well uh-huh. to be able to get the brokers and the market makers out at the same time. But uh-huh. the idea is to start doing that, getting at least like one broker, one market maker, then more. Then it's like a real big thing. That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so that is interesting, right? Because that's not like, oh, we just need to grow 5 or 10%, right? It's like what you have now is almost just like proof of concept. It's like, hey, here's a thing that works, but mm-hmm. it's not real money. I mean, if, you, if you're thinking about like the real finance uh, amount of money, it's not yet. Uh, yeah. And our goal now is to is to get it to be there. We're 100% focused on, on this. And is something about to happen? Is there something in the works? There's some partnerships I can comment on, but there's some, there's some cool things coming along. <laughs> How, like, by the end of the year? For What do you mean, the partnership? Yeah. Yeah, I think our goal is to, by the end of the year, have, uh, let's say, at least one broker and at least one market maker okay. on the platform. That That's our goal. Like, that would be a big jump, right? Yeah, it would be, because it would be, like, a, a year and a couple months after launch, and, and I think it would really be able to take the business to the next step. Why did nobody do this before? Why did no exchange do this? The Chicago Mercantile Exchange is this giant exchange that has markets in things that are kind of like what you have markets in. Right. Some of them are even the same, right? The oil price. Mm-hmm. Why didn't they do this? Or why didn't some other giant, well-funded, uh, you know, exchange do what you're doing? I just don't think they're very, like innovative if in, in some way. I'm no, no, not trying to criticize, <laughs> but if you ask me if they're going to come in, I'm sure I'm sure we're going to get a lot of competition. Uh, I think there's a lot of eyes into the space. And I think that's actually very good for us because for Kaushi to be very successful, we need event contracts to be very successful first. So with more players and we believe the industry can grow uh, and we think we can win if it's uh, if it's head to head with a regulated company like CME, but, but it's always good to, to grow the pie. There have been small election prediction markets for a long time, but not that much money is allowed to be traded on those. People have been so interested for so long, but it has never really been a thing until now. And I still don't think I understand why. Like, why didn't anybody do it before? Nobody has done it until now. Or nobody has been, nobody's gotten regulatory approval, right? right. There's like unregulated crypto prediction markets. Mm-hmm. Why didn't anybody do this until you did it? Yeah, I think, I mean, the regulatory piece is the biggest one. Most of the cases, what actually happened is they tried the, to launch it. And then when the CFTC went to say, what you're doing is illegal, it was it's too late. Like, there's no, like, uh-huh. you know, moving fast and then saying, like, I'm sorry, like, I didn't know. Like, that's not how it works with financial regulation. So most of the cases were actually people doing it illegally. And then the CFTC saying, you shut down right now. And they're like, okay. And obviously, if they've done something illegally before, it's very hard to sell to the CFTC that you actually care about compliance. Yeah. But there's obviously a lot of other timing things, right, that, that helped us. I think the rise, as you mentioned, of unregulated crypto prediction markets, it's it's very hard for the CFTC. It's a game of whack-a-mole. If you're just waiting for the next uh-huh. crypto thing to show up and like, how are you going to work on enforcement in all those cases, I think it's important for them to have a regulated alternative that oh, is that's safe. that's interesting. So, right. so the fact that crypto allowed more unregulated prediction markets to crop up gave the CFTC an incentive to say yes to somebody who wanted to play by the rules. 
Right. I, I don't actually know if they thought about that. That's something I think happened. So just to be clear, they never said anything <laughs> like that. It's it's what I think about it. Because obviously, Sophie, I ask myself, well, like, why, why us? Luana and her co-founder did the work. They did it at the right time. And they kept doing it until the CFTC said yes. Now they just have to solve that hard problem of getting lots more customers by partnering with retail brokerages. At the same time, they're getting lots more liquidity by partnering with market makers. If they can do that, they can go from being this weird little website where you can bet on the weather to being a giant financial exchange. We'll be back in a minute with the lightning round. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, let's do the lightning round. Let's do some fast questions. Sounds good. What's the biggest bet you ever made? Ooh, I've made a big bet on the election with my best friend. How'd you do? I won. Oh, congratulations. I bet against Trump and I won, yeah. <laughs> How big? 10,000. That's big. That's <laughs> yeah. a big bet. I know, I know. I I'm, I have a lot of the trader nature so in me. <laughs> you like you like gambling in general? No, not really. Uh, there, there, this is, this <laughs> yes, is actually you do. no. This is actually my only. Is I'm very passionate about politics in general. Uh, okay. So this was like kind of my first and, and only thing. Never did any like sports betting for sure. Not. I'm like a very actually okay. traditional investor. So you were you were a ballet dancer. Yep. Uh, earlier in your life. So what's harder, running a company or dancing the Nutcracker? Oh, the Nutcracker is easier. So I would say the running, <laughs> running. Did running I picked the wrong ballet. You did. You Dancing did. Swan Lake. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think Swan Lake's harder. It's just. Okay. It's. It's. Yeah, but it, it's okay, completely Swan Lake, different. Swan Lake versus running a company. Uh, Swan Lake. <laughs> it's harder. I think so because the level of like physical uh, demand that you have with ballet is like it changes our entire life. Like nowadays, if I want to still like I don't know, take Saturday night off and go to dinner, I can still do that with ballet. It's like it's about. Everything. Uh, if everything goes well, what problem will you be trying to solve in five years? If everything goes well in five years, um, I think at that point we would be focused more on like international um, expansion. And at that point, I think we would really be onboarding what we really call like natural hedgers. So if you think about like, um, I don't know, Anheuser Busch coming to hedge a change on beer legislation and putting like hundreds of millions of dollars in one position. I think that's what we would be focused on if everything goes well li liquidity wise. I think five years is very ambitious to be doing that, more likely 10, but we're getting this like massive natural hedgers to come uh, to the platform. That's like the end game. How will you know when it's time to do something else? You know what? I asked my, myself this question uh, <laughs> multiple times. I actually have no idea. I actually have no idea. I think it's probably when we run out of all of our money and, <laughs> and all of our employees leave and then probably... I don't know, my family or my friends would be like, come on, I think it's time to, to try to do something else or, or move on. But I don't really see that happening um, unless it's kind of like a this complete catastrophe or something. I mean, that's the sad ending. There's a happy <laughs> ending where the company's doing great and right. it's grown up, and it <laughs> right. that, but you don't think of that one. Oh, yeah, no, I, I don't think of, I mean, you know, for every startup, it's very likely that you're going to fail. Like in the beginning, it was like 99.999%. Like now it's probably a little less than that, but it's uh, it's still very likely that we will fail. And if you if you start thinking about that, there's no reason to take risk and and start a company and try to actually do something different and make a change. So, I try to focus exclusively on the happy case scenario and the good things and and keep pushing and see how, see how it's gonna go. Maybe I am wrong. Uh, I don't know in the future, but yeah. <laughs> when do you think another company will get CFTC approval to let people trade events? I think it, the window could start by like end of this year, beginning of next year. Well, soon. I think they, they could like start like getting I mean, more serious let's about make a, it. Let's make a market in this one though. Let's have it. There's a day, <laughs> right? There's a day. We, okay. You could have a market on Kelsey. You could hedge. Oh, you're not allowed to bet. We're I not. Bet. We're yeah. not. I, I would say I think there's like a um, 30% chance that by the middle of next year, we're going to see someone else like fully focused on events. I think 30%. 30% chance that like by the middle of next 30. year, someone will get a yes from the CFTC. I'm trying to think which side of that will I take. <laughs> it's a subtle, it's, you set the line just right. Also, you have more information than I do. So I'd be a yeah, fool yeah. to take the you other probably, side. You I'm probably not should not trade side. against me on this one. Luana Lopez-Lara is the co-founder of Kalshi.com. 
Today's show was produced by Edith Russelo, engineered by Amanda K. Wong, and edited by Robert Smith. I'm Jacob Goldstein. Next week on What's Your Problem? We make the case for why America must pass a permanent daylight saving time bill before the end of the year. <laughs>